Alabama is known for many things. You have Auburn in Alabama. You have Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. You also have mountains. You also, it also even has murder and other forms of crime. Welcome to Season 4 of the True Crime Lounge Podcast. I do have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe to. I also have a Patreon that you can join. You don't have to, but by joining my Patreon, you will receive early access to episodes that are scheduled to come out. Such as this one. Um, I also have a merch shop that you can go and support. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now, why don't we dive into the reason you tuned in to today's episode, shall we? There you go. Alright. This season on the TCL podcast, we'll be focusing on murderers from the state of Alabama. One case I am excited to be talking about, for those of you that don't know, I was born and raised in Alabama. I'm not an Alabama fan. I'm an Auburn fan. Go ahead, get that right out of the way. Um, last June, I moved to the state of Tennessee. And so, it has been a bit of an adjustment, but you can go to my Breezyville channel and you can hear me talk about all that. But that's for a different ch- channel and podcast. Alright, so on this very first episode of Season 4, we'll be discussing the case of Brian Keith Baldwin. Who exactly was Baldwin? Why are we talking about his case? And what exactly is his significance? Well, Baldwin was a murderer whose characteristics were kidnapping, rape, and robbery. He has at least one known victim in mythology. In his mythology is stab wounds and a cutthroat with an axe and a run over with a car. You almost think he's Lizzie Borden but without the car but with the car. <laughs> in a mail. So, on June 18, 1999, he was executed by electrocution and his accomplice, uh, accomplice, Edward Horsley, was executed in 1996. Brian's last words was, it's okay. Now, one thing I will note, you will notice this season is that I do a lot of death row cases. I noticed that this season upon my research of the 10 cases that I have, I am discussing. So... Who exactly? So, how did Baldwin and Hursley know each other? Well, they were fl- they were fleeing North Carolina prison camp in March 1977, which was minutes before they abducted a Naomi Rowland, who, wow, she was on her way to visit her dad in the hospital. They were choked, stabbed, and sexually assaulted her before driving to Alabama. They eventually killed her with a hatchet with several defense attorneys and others who believed that he was a victim of racism in the judicial system. The interesting thing is that he was convicted by an all-white jury in which black jurors were eliminated by prosecutors. Yeah. This is definitely a case that was the product of the time for sure. Um... Prosecutors believe that he was deeply troubled by several aspects of the case, but declined to the the but declined to grant clemency. Defense lawyers also claimed that Baldwin was beaten into confessing into a county and state dominated by white law enforcement. Well, how did the allegations come about? Well, on June 18, 1999, the state, along with the approval of federal governments, um, executed Brian K. Baldwin in the chair, and the state and the federal governments failed to ensure that Baldwin's w- rights to a fair and impartial trial, his right to be free from torture, and his right to be free from racial discrimination. State torture and, and an unfair racially discriminatory trial resulted in his execution. Remember, this was an allegation that was raised. So, what exactly happened the day of the crime? Well, um, let's go back to March 14, 1977. When 16-year-old Naomi Rowland would meet an ulti- her ulti- untimely demise. Prior to her murder, she had been picked up by Baldwin, who was 18, and Horsley, who was 17, in North Carolina. Then proceeded to drive with them to Alabama. Baldwin and Hursley recently escaped from the detention center prior to this. While in Alabama, Baldwin was still a truck 
and drive off with Rowan. Worsley will later return to alone on foot. Both of them would eventually be arrested, tried, and convicted of murder of Naomi Rowan. So, now, there are some issues about this. One, Brian had been arrested, but his parents were not informed of his location until after he was convicted of capital murder. Another one, the police would repeatedly beat and intimidate Baldwin until he had a conf- signed a confession. Sounds like coercion. Sounds like they coerced a confession to me. Now his confession failed to name the correct weapon and provide an accurate an accurate description of the murder. The confession will late be altered to fit the fact, and his trial would trial would last a total of a day and a half, including jury selection, deliberation, and sentencing. So this is significant because most wait two months before sentencing. Now, let's go to his trial attorney, who failed to undertake an independent pretrial investigation to prepare his client to testify, to and to call defense any defense witnesses to introduce any forensics evidence or to object to improper actions of the prosecution. The forensic evidence would suggest that he was innocent, but it was not introduced at trial. And during the trial, the prosecution will repeatedly suggest that he had committed sexual assault, although he was never charged with sexual assault. After the trial, the state held a complete record from the defense and claimed to have lost the evidence, which was hindering their appeal. Now, 11 years later, before his own execution, his co-defendant confessed to the crime and exonerated Baldwin. At this time, African Americans were intentionally excluded from the jury. Monroe County, which I know what that is, is a small county. To get better understanding, it is home to Monroeville and, and near Atmore. And it, is compl- and it is completely in lower Alabama. Which, if you are from Alabama, then you know that for some reason we have our prisons in this prisons literally in this past um like montgomery and on past in the southern part of the state i don't know why that is but some reason we do anyway um i am from the smaller towns you get all so here's the thing for, about me i am from rural alabama basically a further off the interstate you can get um except for the past eight years where i was living in a town called Coleman, Alabama. Um, but yes. But basically, at this time, 46 percent of the residents were African American. The thing is that he was convicted by an all-white jury. A court would later find that the prosecutor and the judge in his trial and appeal was a del- was deliberate racial discrimination. And at his trial, he was convinced by an all-white. He was convicted by an all-white jury for the murder of Naomi Rowland. The prosecution would successfully exclude all African-American people from the jury. And his attorney did not object, if that tells you anything. So this has to be a product of the time that the trial took place. I believe that. I really do. Now, his conviction was largely based on his confession, though it was coerced. And during his confession... He was beaten and cattled prior to obtain information about his whereabouts of Naomi Rowland. When her body was found, he was beaten and prodded again until he signed a confession that named the wrong weapon and the wrong method used to kill Naomi. In a separate confession, Horsley claimed that Baldwin was the murderer, but supplied accurate information about the murder weapon of in the attack. The information was added to Baldwin's confession after the fact as the signature of a deputy who claimed to have witnessed Baldwin's waiver of rights who was not present. Weird, right? I would think so. Well, the forensic evidence that was discovered shortly before Baldwin's execution showed that the deadly blow was the work of a left-handed assailant. Here's, you want to know something very interesting? Baldwin was not left-handed. Guess who was? Horsley. That's right. Although his clothes and shoes were stained with blood, but Baldwin's clothes being tested negative? 
and, and years after Baldwin had been convicted of sentence, and sentenced to death, Baldwin's co-defendant, Edward Horsley, confessed that later he alone was responsible for the murder of Naomi. And Baldwin knew nothing about the killing until her body was discovered by police. Now, Baldwin's lawyer failed to provide competent counsel. According to Baldwin, his lawyer had met with him for a, 20, a total of 20 minutes before the trial and did no investigation of the trial and presented two witnesses except Baldwin when he did not prepare for testifying. Baldwin's attorney would fail to present forensic evidence and did not want, did not object when the prosecution suggested that a sexual assault may have taken place. Even though Baldwin never has been charged with sexual assault. Baldwin was found guilty of murder and sentenced to die. Very interesting. Well, I hope his soul knows what he did. Alright. Hang on. <laughs> Excuse me. It is that time of year here in the South. <laughs> With weather is bipolar and my sinuses do not enjoy it because I get a bad cold around this time of year. Plus, I'm also in school, guys. Anyway, let's move on to his appeals. The initial appeal claimed claiming Baldwin's trial was mayored by improper procedure and racism was assigned to an original trial judge in this case. Very interesting. He denied the appeal and upheld his earlier decision. The Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals accepted this as a ruling in entirety and denied Baldwin a leave. The action was later announced in a brief sign by 33 prosecutors and judges across the count country, including six justices of the state Supreme Court. Now, despite the discovery of the suppressed trial record and irrespective of the alleged violation of Baldwin's constitutional rights, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court both denied relief. During the appeals process, complete transcripts of Baldwin's trial were withheld from his attorneys. A court recorder claimed no voice tapes of the trial had been made, although both the tapes and the shorthand notes were, around, were discovered 20 years later. Both tapes were revealed out of discrepancies in the transcripts provided that the state after Baldwin's trial. Baldwin was never provided with an opportunity to present the evidence at, at any court. Any court. Now why don't we jump to the conclusion, right? Because we all need to know how this, what goes on, right? Well, he was ex Baldwin was executed despite compelling evidence of his innocence and evidence that he did not receive a fair trial. Allegations of torture and racial bias by the state of Alabama in violation of the constitutional and international human rights were significantly egregious to a, a, a reversal of the trial's court decision. The initiative appeal, alleging improper pr procedure and racism, was heard by the same judge who had convicted Baldwin and was against whom some of the allegations were conducted. Nonetheless, the trial court decision was held. Both state and federal courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, denied release in spite of the numerous and outrageous allegations of his rights violation. Brian Baldwin was executed after sitting in the electric chair for one hour. Let's move on to his state appeals, shall we? The only issue raised as a direct appeal was the whether in Alabama had, Alabama had jurisdiction to try Baldwin for robbery. Messed up, I know. Given the robbery apparently occurred in North Carolina, robbery had the sole aggravating circumstance cited by the prosecution to qualify his murder as capital offense. The Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals and the Alabama Supreme Court rejected the jurisdictional challenge. Now, that is it for today's episode. I will see y'all next time. Um, tune in every Tuesday for a new episode. And y'all have a great day.